Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming here after lunch. I hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, I'm Istvan Juhas from Circuit, and we'll be talking about migration related to Compose and what can go wrong. Um, first of all, uh, by Compose, I mean Jetpack Compose and Compose Multiplatform, but I will be referring to it as just Compose for, uh, for ease of use. Another thing, uh, before we dive deep into some topics, is some explanation of the background. First of all, it's AI enhanced just because I have to mention AI today, right? Or it, was it yesterday? I didn't know. Um, and why it is AI enhanced is because it's taken actually from an episode of a 1979 show called Dexter's Laboratory. And um, uh, the episode was called Lab of the Lost. And pretty much the synopsis of the short episode is our protagonist who built this uh, physics-defying uh, sci-fi laboratory in his uh, parents' basement. Uh, is that he, by an accident, he lands in this old, really old, neglected, forgotten part of his laboratory where his old, neglected inventions turn against him and uh, do things to him. Um, so, there can be, there, there is a parallel that can be drawn between this uh, lab of the lost or um, old lab and our code bases. So at this point, I'd like to ask you, uh, do you think you have an old lab, any part of your code base? So hands up if you think you have an old lab. Yeah, that's what I was expecting. <laughs> Double hands sometimes. OK, so for the rest of you, if you don't have an old lab, well, first things first, good for you. I really envy you. But um, on the other hand, your current lab, however good it is, however new it is, will become your old lab one day. And yes, that applies to KMP projects as well. So um, to try to minimize the impact of um, our code, our code base getting, um, getting in that old lab stage, there are some things that we can do to, uh, yeah, to prevent that, basically, or just be mindful about this. The first topic I'd like to touch is code base fragmentation. So code base fragmentation is the phenomena that happens if you add new things, new technologies, new method methodologies well, uh, to your existing code base without updating uh, uh, the rest of your code base. You know, this can pretty much apply to Android projects or every other project, basically, but now we're talking about Android. And uh, we'll just keep the discussion on the UI level. So regarding code-based fragmentation, we have quite a history to catch up with. Uh, for a long time now, we have views that's kind of the same age as Android itself. And then after some years, we had data binding. And again, after some years, we got view binding. And at this point, as I've seen many hands up, probably um, that thing is haunting you in your dreams and in your daily jobs as well. Um, so, of course, getting composed in 2021 was a delightful addition. Finally, um, a declarative UI framework. Finally, we could move away from views. Finally, we can leave those things behind. Um, well, or can we? Because let's say that, okay, Compose was released, and we want to move on to Compose. We want to rewrite everything co to Compose. Um, well, that's a great dream, but in reality, it could be more like this. You have your existing code base fragmentation with everything in your old lab, and then you add Compose to it. Um, why can that happen? Of course, um, you or your team, your company might not have the resources, time, money, and so on to do a complete refactoring, a complete rewrite of the application. The application might be big uh, or small, but the business might be small, and so on and so forth. Or there is no business case to do so, because um, you know there is this saying that don't touch what works. Probably in your code base, no one wants to touch what works because they're afraid of the old lab. Um, or you know those things generate money for the company, so the company itself doesn't want you to touch those parts of your code. Um, if you're luckier and you did have resources to start some migrations, some refactoring, um, or even modularization at this point, um, well, it might be a good idea to just finish those first and then jump on the compost train. 
So while in theory you could just add Compose to your code base, um, the reality is you might have some things to do before jumping on that train. Let's say we took the leap, we took care of everything uh, in our code base regarding modularization, um, DI, and um, architecture, and everything. And we are at a state where we have this module layout, whichever you chose from the popular ones now on the scene. Let's say we went with feature modules, and we want to introduce Compose. Uh, we could do that just by introducing it module by, by module. So at least with this, you keep the code base fragmentation on the module level and not mix and match everything up in, your, in the rest of your code base. This is kind of okay, right? And if you reach a stage where you can start with the other modules or can start uh, migrating um, the rest of your code base to compose, then you could get this state, which is uh, pretty much awesome. You get rid of code base fragmentation, preferably everywhere, but at least on the UI level, and you can have Compose everywhere. This is a magical state to be in. And then let's imagine something and uh, go a bit out of our way into KMP land. Um, if you're in the previously described state with your project, you can easily start migrating your project into the Compose multi uh, Kotlin multi-platform uh, project layout. You pretty much have to copy over your Android project, do some Gradle magic to fit into the Kotlin multi-platform um, project setup. And um, yeah, you could start sharing Compose multi-platform at this point. Of course, it's not that easy, but it could be if you've done everything else before. And then you can start the actual heavy lifting on the multi-platform side, uh, introducing first the iOS project into the multi-platform uh, project, and then Compose. Well, of course, uh, a Compose multi-platform, of course. Um, yeah, of course, this presents another whole another set of problems, uh, namely iOS engineers. I wouldn't say problems. I, I phrased that wrong, actually. So. It's not a problem, it's, it's, uh, it's a different set of things that to handle in this state. So, of course, iOS de developers probably won't be on board right away. Just imagine that they are doing their native stuff uh, since iOS was born, since the whole toolkit was born, and they really love Swift, they really love Swift UI, just as we love Compose and Kotlin. So convincing them to at least, uh, um, if not touch, but at least look into uh, KMP and Compose Multiplatform might be difficult. So it probably just takes time. They will see it's good. Okay, um, after that little detour to KMP land, let's get back to the boring Android parts. With another topic, we are stepping, um, we're, we're getting one step back. And let's see what, we, what can go wrong with mixing views and compose if you do that instead of having all your migrations laid out and done in sequence. So if you just jump on the compose train and start mixing and matching uh, views and compose in your project, well, the thing is that you can do this, uh, but it might not be a good idea, but you can. And... Um, yeah, the interoperability APIs are there. You can write hybrid UIs with Compose and Views. You can test them and so on and so forth. But one thing that we are adopting Jetpack Compose for is to get rid of as much XML as possible. Um, one of the catching points of Jetpack Compose was to have less context switching between XML and code. Just ditch the XML parts as much as possible. But if we start mixing up views and compose actively on our screens, just to have compose in our code base, we are introducing actually more context switching, which could be on any level of our UI. So the, uh, this kind of context switching is between views and compose. So you open up a screen that has compose views, all, open up a screen XML, sorry, uh, that has compose views all over it, 
And in the, uh, you, you go into the, con uh, the Kotlin code, which sets up those compose views, and then you go deep into it, and, it, and uh, you come up with the thing that it's finally an Android view deep into, in the composition. So that's not a good state to be in. It's pretty easy to achieve, unfortunately. And if you do such things, you mix up uh, views and compose all of your UI tests that are touching these hybrid screens, will need to be compose aware to pass because uh, if you're testing uh, because to test the compose parts of your layouts uh, the composition should be there the compose testing tooling should be there so possibly all or most of your ui tests uh, have to be rewritten or adjusted and depending on the complexity of your ui testing setup that might require a lot of time and effort and as I mentioned before, Compose View Interrupt can be overused, can be deeply nested. There can be an Android view somewhere deep nested inside your uh, composable hierarchy, which in fact is in a, probably a layout. So um, that might cause performance issues, um, legibility issues, and um, uh, overall cognitive overhead. OK, last topic to, uh, that I'll be touching is um, theming in Compose, uh, which might sound like an easy topic because, well, the tooling makes us, uh, makes us think it's easy. And also, if you just create a project, the team is already there and so on and so forth set up for us, not on, uh, con not on the Compose multi-platform project, but on the Android project. So um, yeah, let's get back to the topic. Theming in Compose is kind of easy if you use Material, of course. Um, when we start a new Android project now with Compose, because what else should we be starting uh, with now? Uh, we get this app theme, which in, fact the, which in fact uses Material theme as an implementation. That's quite all right, um, because most of the Compose components that you will be facing right uh, out of the box in a new project or in most of the examples out there will be using uh, the Material components from uh, from compose from the compose material library, so it's kind of okay. And after that, you start using your own theme. You will wrap possibly your whole application or just parts of your composable hierarchies in your theme, and then you want some ver some values from that theme to customize some of the components of your UIs, and then you get this discrepancy here. You use your theme, but you have to access stuff from material theme. So at this point, your theme is leaking the implementation details into your composable hierarchy, which again can be okay. It's not a big of a, not too big of a deal, but um, if you look at what material can offer you at this point, uh, it's not too much. You can get shapes, typography, and color schemes from that material theme object. And yeah, by the way, this is an object and not the composable. We can't call anything on composables because those are functions. So this is a, an object that lives uh, uh, next to the material theme uh, composable. And it actually provides composition locals via this object that are uh, provided by the theme itself. What if we want to go the custom UI, uh, custom design system route with some spacings, dimensions, components, specific semantic colors, sizes, typography, so on and so forth, whatever you uh, want to have in your custom design system? Well, you have to go with uh, some custom stuff. And at this point, probably you will have to go with some custom design system choices or custom design, design system decisions. Um, because eventually material just won't be enough for everything that you want to do in an application or in a com custom application, of course. Not everything is compatible with material, right? So what you can do is create your custom data models, create your custom composition locals, and actually create your own, uh, own uh, object that provides all these composition local values to you. You can call it the same uh, name as your theme, as Material does, and um, then that discrepancy disappears in, uh, the, on the use sites, and uh, you can just cover up Material theme at all. This is good because eventually, if you if you run into the problem 
of material being not enough, you don't have to change up all your code base, change everything to your theme, and so on and so forth. Uh, in my experience, it's actually just better to go with uh, with this custom solution right out of the box, or just wrap material theme into something and don't leak it into the implement rest of the implementation. Uh, with that, uh, we're kind of out of time, so I'll just mention some things that could also uh, go wrong if you do your migrations wrong. Navigation, of course, if you still use data binding, probably you're still using Jetpack navigation with fragments and activities and so on and so forth. So deciding where to introduce Compose in the fragments, in the activities, keep the fragments and activities, or go full Compose in modules, in, uh, in not in other modules, so on and so forth. Navigation is a complex topic by itself. Adding Compose to the mix just adds fuel to the fire. Uh, composable code organization. Um, there are countless articles out there uh, about how to organize your compose code to be efficient. Uh, previews, should we write them, shouldn't we write them? Do previews take more time to write than actual UIs? That's the decision you have to make. Um, we already touched the topic of overusing a compose view and actually abstract compose view. Uh, abstract compose view can be used in a way to re uh, use compose to render views, so custom views. So um, yeah, just tread lightly with these interrupt features. Of course, all of this can have a performance impact. Compose itself can have a performance impact. Uh, running uh, or testing your app in debug mode all the time might uh, uh, make you believe that Compose is underperforming. Um, um, but maybe it's just the tooling that holds it back. So uh, every time you pretty much have to test in uh, the release environment as well, or the release build. And this one we already touched as well, con convincing iOS engineers to just look into KMP and uh, you know drop their premonitions and just mm, you know move out of their comfort zone is our job as well. So wrapping things up, uh, I like to plant two thoughts in the end in your head, if, uh, if you may. Uh, one is finish your existing migrations before you add Compose to the mix, and even Compose multi-platform. So before you just go on and put your existing Android project into a multi-platform project, just clean up your old lab and try to keep up with all the new things if you want to, or if you have the time and resources to. It's not a race. Um, and also take your time to learn about Compose and take your time to get used to it, get used to the tooling uh, and uh, possibly do it together with your team because the code you write today will be the old lab of tomorrow and yeah, keep it as clean as possible. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Don't forget to vote in the app and yeah, thank you for hearing me rambling here. Thank you.